when I uh, when I sit down with a new believer, someone in, who's in the process of of uh, coming to Christ, I I like to start the conversation something like this. Why don't we start by your telling me your worst sin? And then we'll have that out of the way. Of course I, of course I don't do that. Can you, can you imagine? Can you imagine if, if I did start the conversation like this? Let me say, you know what? Uh, do you have any of those yellow cards that say I'm out? Um, and uh, go that direction. But let's stop for just a second. Why do you think we respond that way? Why do you think that we are, are so much at a point to where we think, I, I, I don't want people to know about me? I mean, the fact is, is that we don't want other people to know our sins. And so we keep them locked away, even though, even though we know that the Bible tells us, confess your sins to each other that God, God directs us to do those, but we still, we still hide our... As a matter of fact, I, I'm convinced that we even think sometimes that we can hide our sins from God. Think, you know what, I, 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 you know, I, I really don't want you to see who I really am, God. And, uh, or, or we do something, we say, man, I hope God didn't see that one. But we know he does. Here, here's, here's the truth. I, I, I like the way that uh, the commentator... Uh, Warren Wiersbe puts it, he said, God sees every sin and knows every evil thought and yet stays his hand of judgment and discipline for a season, offering us the opportunity to repent. You see, God sees it, but he doesn't, he doesn't automatically say, okay, here's, judgment, here's the judgment that's going to come on you because he wants to offer us a season of of repentance. Now, that's a pretty sobering statement, isn't it? I mean, when we look at that, we like to separate ourselves from words like judgment and discipline and repentance. Um, You know, we like to think more on on happy words. But the truth is, these are important words for the Christ follower. And we see this process. This process is repeated over and over and over in the Bible. And it, it, it looks something like this, is, is that the people of God choose to sin. And not only do they choose to sin, but when they're called into account, they refuse to repent. They refuse to say, okay, we, we humbly acknowledge who we are and what we've done to you, God. They refuse to repent, and so God disciplines them. And sometimes, if you look through the Bible, you will see that the discipline is quite harsh. But the purpose of God's discipline is always intended to bring people to repentance. Now, I know that in our society today, we like to quote Romans 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And I believe that, but sometimes God's kindness is very severe. The book of Hebrews paints that picture very, very well for us. The writer of Hebrews says this about God and discipline. It says, have you forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons? My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. So endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons for what son is not disciplined by his father. If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, he certainly didn't seem to live in this day and age, um, but that notwithstanding, says if, if you are not disciplined, then you are illegitimate children, and you are not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? I am, this, this year, um, I, I chose to do my, my Bible reading. I try to get through the entire Bible a couple, couple of times uh, every, every year. And um, this year I chose to do it a little bit differently. I chose to do it chronologically. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I would encourage all of you, it's just not a difficult t- thing to do. Take some time, read God's word. 
Um, because as, as you read it, it unfolds and you see God's picture in, in just an incredible way. But this year I chose to do it, um, I, I chose to do it chronologically. And so I, I purchased a chronological Bible. And what that means is it puts everything in order, at least as far as we can understand. And I, I had never officially done that before. Of course, I'd taken some harmony classes uh, while I was in Bible college and, and those kind of things. Um, but I'd never officially read through the entire Bible in a chronological way. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. One of the things that you see when you read it that way is you see how the books all fit together and how they overlap and, and what's going on. And I mean, did you realize that the book of Job actually comes right smack in the middle of the book of Genesis? chronologically speaking. Now, the last 12 books of the Bible are, are like that. I think we tend to tuck the last 12 books of the Bible at the end as if they were just some pages thrown in because you needed your Bible to weigh a little bit more or something like that. And as a matter of fact, we call those last 12 uh, books of the Old Testament, we call them the minor prophets. That is a horrible misrepresentation of what they are because the only thing minor about those prophets is the length of their books which is why they call them that but packed in those small books are some incredibly important and timely teachings and so what I'd like to do is is I would like to take you on a journey from now and until we hit Thanksgiving and uh, I want us to to focus on these 12 books. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail on every one of those books because we, we really just don't have time for that. But what I want to do is to whet your appetite so that you will, on your own, take the time and go in and study and, and read those books just a little bit more and more so that you can have a further look and a further understanding of what those books that we call the Minor Prophets about. And that's what we're going to do uh, from now until, uh, until Thanksgiving. So with that said, let's pray together. God, I, I thank you for who you are and thank you for the opportunity that you have given to me to, to share with, with this church in, in life. Father, forgive me because my sins, you know my sins, and they are many. And I simply ask that you would forgive me and that you would teach me day by day uh, to be more like your son Christ, that you would uh, just work inside of me to change those things. Father, I ask that as we spend this time together this morning, I, I ask that we would simply allow you um, to speak to us and that we would hear your words and that we would follow your words. So, Father, go with, with this through, through the rest of our time this morning and, and teach us. That's our prayer in the name of Jesus. What you see in front of you here is a chart of the prophets of the Old Testament. And you'll, you'll notice that it goes from the year 950 to 400. So we're talking, you know, we're, we're roughly, you, you, you can see the time frame in there. <coughs> and on the top of the page, where it says Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, and Persia, those are the different captivities that the children of Israel went through. First, in about the year 950, they went in captivity in Egypt. Then <coughs> they, they come out of that captivity. Then they go through uh, the, Assyrian, um, the Assyrian dispersion is essentially what that was. And then the Babylonian captivity and then the Persian. Again, that becomes more of an, another type of dispersion. But under that, you see a, a couple of events like Solomon dies, Israel falls, Judah falls, those kind of things. And it talks about the major prophets there. Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Daniel, and Ezekiel, and then minor prophets, and you see the minor prophets listed there, Obadiah, Joel, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Micah, Nahum, uh, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Haggai, uh, Zechariah, and Malachi, and of course underneath there then there's some other prophets, Elijah and Elisha, who, who don't even have uh, books of their, their own, but it, it gives us, it gives us a picture, and we, we, we need to kind of see how this all fits together, and it's a relatively short period of time <coughs> when all this has taken place. But, now, honestly, I don't want you to get caught up in this. Um, this is just for information purposes, really, is what this is, and you can find other charts 
online or maybe even in the back of your Bibles or your study Bibles or whatever. But this is just for the purpose of information because I don't want to take a scholarly approach to this whole thing, uh, mainly because I don't consider myself a scholar. Um, <coughs> I consider myself a student, and I'm, I'm uh, always learning. Anyway, the last 12 books, the Minor Prophets, in these Minor Prophets, I see three really important themes that keep coming up time and time and time again, and one important process. Let me give you the process first. <coughs> the process is that God is always seeking ways to unite with his people, and when they stray, he desires, and not only desires, but he works for their return. That's the process that, goes, that God goes through. So people stray from him, but he is always at work with his desires to bring the people back to him. That's a fact. That's the way that God God works. And so what I want to do with the rest of this morning here, so I'm going to give you an overview of those last 12 books uh, before we launch into those starting next week. And I told you I see three themes that keep po popping up or cropping up, however you want to say it. And here they are. The first theme is wake up. Wake up. Particularly when you look at the books of Amos and Obadiah and Micah and Zephaniah, you will see this, that these are prophets who are saying, look, it's time to wake up. God has to get your attention. You're just kind of going through the motions. You're not, getting, you're not having a relationship with God, and so God has to wake you up. And God is telling his people through the prophets every time that they have strayed from him and that there is a judgment that's coming. Now, that's an important truth. Because I want you to understand this. Sin always has a consequence. Sin always has a consequence. Matter of fact, every temptation should come with this warning label. Is that God is a holy God and therefore must discipline his people when they sin. Every temptation should come with this. Because God is holy and when we choose to sin there is always a consequence. Now that doesn't mean that God has given up on his people or turned his back on them. Because every discipline, as I told you before, every discipline is intended for the process of repentance. It's intended to bring his children back to him and to restore with God a right relationship. In his first letter to the Corinthian Christian, you say, well, that kind of sounds like an Old Testament thing. No, no. Here on this side of the cross, when the Apostle Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth, he tells them this, de he gives this de detailed account of the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel. Particularly, you start about the latter part of the ninth chapter, and you go into the tenth chapter, and he tells you the story about the children of Israel. And he tells you how when they were going across the, the, the wilderness, is that they, they began to grumble. And so God, in his infinite love and mercy, eliminated several thousand in one day. Tells us a little bit later on, when they got to the area of Moab, that the children of Israel decided to play fast and loose sexually with the Moabite women, and God had said, don't do that. And so in that day, thousands were killed by the sword. And so... Later on, the children said, well, we don't like this, this, this stuff that you keep giving us to eat. All we get is manna, and, and we're tired of this, and, and, and we're tired of, uh, of this whole journey, and we really wish it would probably have been better if we had died back in Egypt, and so God sends snakes. Now, at the end of that account, here's what Paul says. He says, these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. And remember, he's talking to those of us on this side of the cross, in this day and age of grace. He says, these things are written down as examples and were written as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So see, these things were written about them for you not to be like them. They are warnings. 
And that's the picture of the minor prophets, is that they come into the nation of Israel and they speak to the children of Israel and say, things have got to change. You've got to turn back to God. And the prophets time and time again warn them. And sometimes they listen and sometimes they don't. It's interesting to me that the Apostle Paul in that letter to the Corinthians, the next verse, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. What he's saying to us is, is if we think, well, we're, we're okay. I'm not moral, I'm just forgiven. He says, look, when you think that you're standing Be careful. As a matter of fact, the tense of the verb here is that the fall is already in progress. The first theme that we'll see as we go through is wake up and pay attention. Pay attention to what God has to say. The second theme is look up. It's look up. When God gets your attention, now he wants to speak to you. The Minor Prophets span some 450 plus years in the nation of Israel. It is a, it a, and at that time, God is using discipline to get them to wake up so the pur- for the purpose of talking to them. And through the Minor Prophets, we see that God wants to communicate several things to them. And I think there are some things that we really need to understand is that number one is he wants to commu- they want to communicate the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God, simply put, means that God is in control of all things. Now, it's very popular today to say, well, everything happens for a reason. And I would suppose because there's a law of cause and effect going on, there, that is true to a certain perspective. But when you try to spiritualize that, that's wrong. Sometimes things happen because we make really bad decisions. Just because God is in control of everything does not mean that God causes everything. That is very different. Do you understand that? Now, that doesn't mean that God can't use everything because God can. For example, Lon or Joseph or whoever he was last week talked to us and he said that Joseph's brothers, what they did was was meant to harm Joseph, but God intended it. God used it. For good. And that's the way that life is. Another way for us to say that, simply found in the New Testament, says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Now understand, there's a difference between God causing something and God working in something. And the promise is that no matter what happens, if we will turn to God, he can use Whatever happens, all the good things, all the bad things, we talked about that in our last series. He can use those things for his glory and for our benefit. He can use that. That is the sovereignty of God. The second thing that they want to communicate is the holiness of God. The holiness of God. Stated in another way, that is that God is perfect in every way imaginable. And because God is perfect in every way, because God is sinless, he cannot tolerate sin. He can't do it. So that puts us in a a bit of a predicament. I ran across this, and I I love the way that uh, Wiersbe said this. He said, his holiness, talking about God's holiness, his holiness raises a significant problem for every human being. Because we are all sinners, and as such are separated from a holy and righteous God. Yet God enables every person to become holy in his sight through repentance and acceptance of Christ's sacrifice on the cross as payment for his sin. You see, there is a, there is a through. We don't believe, because the Bible doesn't teach universalism, that God just causes everybody and and God just ultimately overlooks everything. He doesn't do that. But he gives us the opportunity. He has provided the way for us that when we turn to him 
and we accept the blood of Christ on that cross of Calvary as a payment for our sins, then God makes it so that we can now be in a perfect and a holy relationship with him. And that's an important thing. You see, because in God's scheme of things, in God's scheme of things, with the bad news, and the bad news is that we are sinners, and because we are sinners, we are separated from God. And there is an eternal punishment for separation from God. That's the bad news, but with the bad news is the good news. And the good news is the gospel that Jesus Christ offers us forgiveness of sins and salvation if we will accept him. That's the gospel. Always the gospel. But as a holy God, God must judge sin. He must. And so in the minor prophets, you'll see that because the children of Israel sin, God sends the minor prophets to speak to them. And, he tells, and, and they tell the children of Israel to look up, look to God, repent, and come back to God. And so he sends those prophets to th tell the children of Israel to look up. And that leads to the third aspect. And that aspect is the love of God. Do you understand that the very fact that God sent the prophets to the children of Israel demonstrates his love for them? I mean, God doesn't say, well, you separated yourself, so good luck with that one, pal. He sends the prophets. He, he, he makes a way so that the children of Israel can listen, so that they can wake up, so they can look up and see that God wants to talk to them. Because God is gracious and God is merciful and God doesn't want to see anyone perish. It's not God's idea that anyone would be separated from him. He wants everyone to be in a right, righteous relationship with, with us. And so in many ways, the prophets are simply pointing their fingers forward to where ultimately then God will give his son, Jesus Christ, as the ultimate payment for our sins. But he calls them, as he calls us, to look up to him and to listen to what he has to say. Now, the third theme is our response. And that's to follow up. That's to follow up. What I mean by that is do we follow in the footsteps? Do we follow in the places that God has called us to look? Every one of these 12 men who make up the minor prophets is a hero of faith. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Those 12 men. Now, those may be unfamiliar names to us. And for the most part, they're not names that we think, and you know what, if I have, uh, if I have another child, uh, I think I'm going to name him Habakkuk. <laughs> or, you know, I, I really hope that one of my kids chooses to name their son Habakkuk. We don't think like that. A couple of them that are not so bad. For the most part, they're just names that we just kind of pass over, and there are 12 books at the end of our Old Testament that we kind of pass over because we want to get to the New Testament. But those are heroes of faith because they chose to stand up and do what God asked them to. There was a prophet by the name of Hosea. God says to Hosea one day, Hosea, how are you doing? You having a good week, Hosea? Hosea says, so far, so good. God says, here's what I got in store for you, bud. I want you to go down to the red light district, and, and I'm going to point out, I'm going to point out a prostitute. And I want you to take that prostitute, and I want you to marry her. And Hosea says, 
I think you got the wrong number. <laughs> Guess says, no, no, no. I want you to marry that prostitute. Can you imagine when Hosea takes this prostitute? And if it isn't bad enough that he's taken a prostitute home with him to meet the folks, her name is Gomer. <laughs> Hi, Mom and Dad. Here's my new wife. Well, we didn't know you were getting married. Well, what's her name? Uh, her name is Gomer. <laughs> it goes, oh, man. Okay, Gomer. That's a pretty name. No, it's not. It's an horrible name. And then Dad says, by the way, where did the two of you meet? <laughs> he can't even say match.com. <laughs> he says, uh, well, you know, you know, that street down there, that's where, we, that's where we met. But Hosea follows God's command because God wants to illustrate that though Gomer is not only a prostitute and he takes her into his house and it looks like maybe there's going to be a happy, a bit of a happy ending to this whole thing, uh-uh. She goes out and does the same thing over and over. Because God is illustrating to the nation of Israel that they, like we so many times, have committed spiritual adultery. Time and time again and taken on another God. But if you read through the book of, of Hosea, you find it's a story of redemption at the end because God is always, always reaching out to his children so that they can return and restore a relationship. In a Minor Prophets, there's a guy by the name of Jonah. Jonah gets a pretty bad rap, doesn't he? He's a chicken boy. God says, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I, I want you to tell the Ninevites, I want you to tell those Ninevites that I'm going to destroy them because they're horrible people. Now, here's what you don't know very often about the Ninevites. They were the Assyrians. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria at the time. And the Assyrians were known for being particularly fearless and strong warriors. And not only were they fear fearless and strong, but they were mean. And they thought nothing of those that they came in battle. I mean, pillaging and raping, those are nothing. Those were just the first steps. They like to cut off thumbs. They like to torture. They like to beat. They like to do everything bad that you can think of to the victims. And Jonah's thinking to himself, okay, you're sending me to these guys with the message that they're going to die. How do you think that's going to go over? But you know what Jonah really has in the back of his mind? He knows God. And he knows that God wants all people to come to him. And Jonah, even at the beginning, has this thing figured out that he doesn't know how it's going to happen, but he knows somehow he's going to look like a fool because he's going to go to, and there's, somehow God's going to work it out so that they return to him. And as you read the book of Jonah, that's exactly what happens. Because God always says, sometimes I've got to get your attention. Sometimes I need you to wake up. And sometimes I need you to look up. I need you to follow up. I need you to follow me.
And I know this morning that God is saying to the United States of America, sometimes I look at where we are today and I think that that term United States is such an incredible farce. God is saying, look, America, it's time to wake up. It's time for you to look up. And it's not about whatever political party you choose to espouse yourself to. I don't even know how Christians do it, to be real frank with you. It's about looking up to God. Because if you think Donald Trump has the answers, you're, you're severely mistaken. If you think Barack Obama had their answers, you're, you're severely mistaken. If you think the next guy or gal or whoever has the, the answers, you are severely mistaken. Because they don't. Only God does. And it will only be when we choose to wake up and look up and to listen to what God has to say. To what God has to say. And then choose to follow. Then we'll find our way home. These are sobering times, friends. But they're not desperate times. Mm -mm. I promise that God can work in all things for his good, for those who are called according to his purpose and love him. That promise is as good today as it's ever been. That promise is as true today as it has ever been. And I, I am excited. Honestly, I'm excited for the next several weeks as we go into this study of those people who are called the minor prophets who maybe, maybe for us today, maybe they're the most major of all. I'm excited for those times as we take a look at them together and, and as you go home and hopefully we'll, we'll take the time to dig in and, and see more, even more for yourself. Because I know God has the answer. I don't, I don't, I don't need to have the answer. All I need is to point us to Jesus, to point us to God's word and he'll give us the answer. But we gotta wake up. We gotta look up and we gotta follow up. So I guess the question for us is, are we willing? Are we willing to put it all on the line for the cause of Christ? Are we? Are, are we willing to understand that even when we blow it like Jonah, that even if God takes us through some type of discipline, it is for our good and for God's glory. And God is gracious, and all God really wants to do is restore us to his work. What a great God. What a great Father. And Father, this morning I am so thankful for you give us all things. And you don't leave us. You take us where you want to you take where you want to take us. You move us where you want to move us. Father, I pray that you would help me as as I seek to unpack some of these passages, some of these people that maybe we haven't taken a look at or even thought of in a long time. And apply their lessons to our lives. That we, are not, that, that we are not the children of Israel whose bones littered the desert. But that we are your children who walk to you and who are restored and through the power of Jesus Christ live. It's in his mighty power and his name that we ask you, Father, to accept our amen.